Hello, everyone. Uh, today, I want to give you a brief update on the state of affairs in Ukraine. I want to touch on four key points uh, as far as why the West needs to commit uh, additional support. So the first thing I want to say is that as far as an international aid mission or maybe, you know, an international military supply mission, the West is supplying quite a bit of resources to Ukraine. However, if you compare it to the Lend-Lease days of World War II and some of the other things we did during the Cold War, it's still relatively small. In today's dollars, the United States gave at least half a trillion dollars to the Allies uh, before entering uh, combat in World War II. And, and we're well below 50 billion right now. And it also, as much as Ukrainians love Boris Johnson, you, the UK has only set, sent about 3 billion, which is really much lower than I thought. So the first reason we want to uh, support Ukraine more is because the current level of support we're giving is not doing anything to stop the humanitarian crisis. So Russia, the terrorist state of Russia, is still terrorizing Ukrainian civilians. Um, the Ukrainians killed, the civilians killed is somewhere in the 20,000 range. Now the, now the UN has it at around 5,000, but it's, it's really a lot more because they're only counting people who are in the Ukrainian territory right now. The territory that's being held by the Russians like Mariupol and uh, now Lysychansk and Severodonetsk, uh, we don't have the numbers on that. And that's where the majority of the casualties are. The Ukrainian government estimates around 30,000. So I'll go ahead and say, yeah, 20,000. So there's the obvious humanitarian crisis. And as someone who has worked with a lot of Ukrainians and has a lot of Ukrainian friends, uh, it's not just the deaths and the maimings of which there are countless, but it's also this massive mental health crisis where this you know, fast developing emerging market, uh, this country that was on track to get into the EU, yeah, they had big problems with corruption and that was well documented, but I mean, I lived there, it was a pretty nice place to live and uh, people were very educated. All of that's been totally derailed and there's a lot of people walking around the world right now who are like, oh my God, my home is being destroyed, my people are being killed. Um, and that is, it, the thing is, is like, as this crisis has gone on, um, I regret to say that I've sort of, I've sort of normalized in a way. I mean, I still think about Ukraine all the time, but like, I'm thinking about like my career now and like what classes I should take. And those are things that, you know, I have, I have seen some Ukrainians go and get jobs. Um, a one Ukrainian, Victoria, she's really smart and hardworking and, uh, she went out and got jobs. And there's some other Ukrainians who are finding, you know, joy in the little things. You know, I have a friend here in America uh, who's made some friends, and it's just a, an absolute uh, inspiration to see her her smile despite everything that's going on. She's from Kharkiv, which has suffered a lot. Um, I have noticed that, um, and this is obvious, but stupid humans, we we forget this. It's not like the Ukrainians are going to be able to move on from this ever. I mean, even if they totally beat the Russians and push them back, even take Crimea back. These are really big mental scars here, right? So yeah, the first point is obviously humanitarian. Let me just touch on the, the military as far as what we could supply. So even military analysts now are saying that the time to kind of pussyfoot around is, uh, is gone. I mean, we're in too deep here. So you know, look at the effect that just sending 10 or so HIMARS or HIMARS had. Um, imagine if we sent like 50. And now imagine if in February, uh, instead of saying, oh, there's all these technicalities and all these logistical problems, if we had just started training pilots on how to fly F-16s and there are F-16s in the sky right now um, with, you know, uh, munitions that were designed to kind of take cruise missiles out of the sky and things like that. Um, I'm thinking there's probably several thousand civilian lives that could have been saved say nothing of the gains on the battlefield, right? So now we're really, I, I think we were kind of trying to prevent this World War III scenario. Um, look, the United States government 
it's not a perfect machine. I think we all know that. But let me just make one thing perfectly clear if Joe Biden has not done a good enough job of this. Putin doesn't give a shit. Okay, Putin doesn't care what weapons we send and what we don't send. He wants to kill people. Um, he wants to expand his empire, the empire where 10 people are trillionaires and everybody else makes $300 a month. Wow. Yeah, I wonder why you have to use the military to expand that. I wonder why you're low on soft power. Um, Russia, the Russian government, isn't really known for giving a shit about people. Okay, and they're not going to start getting offended or getting their, their toes stepped on because we send F-16s. In fact, um, this whole not sending F-16s and not sending massive amounts of the really big guns has basically just been an extended vacation for Putin because um, otherwise he's screwed. But by pussyfooting around, by not being serious enough, um, we're basically giving him a pass and we're, we're putting it on easy mode for him. He's able to manage this kind of mess and salvage something. Someone like Emmanuel Macron would tell you that's a good thing. It's not. It's really not. You don't need a master's in public policy to know that Vladimir Putin isn't the kind of guy that gives a shit about this stuff. So if you want to speak his language, send F-16s. I mean, send F-16s is like, is like a benchmark. I mean, there should be some, there should be a lot more toys than that, right? Um, although I will say, you know, obviously there's some credit, you know, sending javelins was good. The logistics was good, right? That was all great. But I mean, really we are, um, we are, our strategy right now is gonna drag this conflict out. <clears throat> so we need to understand that taking that military strategy uh, at this point, I would say is costing more lives than it's saving. The next thing, um, all you finance people out there, <laughs> this food crisis is gonna drive up food prices. That's true. You better watch your stocks because food prices are gonna go up and that's gonna make the inflation problem even worse. But hey, you know what else is bad about high food prices? People starving to death. So yeah, this could affect your portfolio. This could affect business. It's also going to affect like millions and hundreds of millions of people who a few months ago were able to eat food fairly reliably, all of a sudden won't be. So bread costing more money and eggs costing more money. Um, yeah, that's going to be felt here. And that's going to tie in with our 10% inflation, right? And that's going to really hurt you, right? Say nothing of the gas prices, which could be reduced uh, as soon as this war is over, that's as soon as you can pay $3, $3 a gallon again, right? But on top of the, the pinch being felt financially, um, we are actually gonna start seeing lots of people starving to death, specifically in Africa, right? But in other countries as well. Uh, Sri Lanka is gonna have a pretty bad food crisis. They were already gonna have one. Uh, so, so countries that were already struggling with this are on the brink. They're going to be uh, they're going to be facing some real problems. And if you're one of these people that says, "Oh, uh, we should we shouldn't be sending money to other countries when uh, when there's people suffering in our country," wait till you see how much money we have to spend to keep these people fed. Okay, not Ukrainians, Africans, Sri Lankans, um, you know, other other countries that are kind of on the brink. We're talking billions of dollars, right? Billions of dollars, lots of subsidies, doing business with countries that we really shouldn't be doing business with. I mean, I could see a potential uh, humanitarian aid mission to Venezuela if they're unable to, uh, if, the, if something with food prices happens there. Um, I mean, that all that money is gonna be scalped by the, by the corrupt government, right? So, so you don't like sending billions of dollars to defend freedom in Europe? Wait until you're giving billions of dollars to oligarchs in Venezuela, who are the people are just gonna starve anyway. But there's gonna be such a moral imperative that, uh, really, you'd, you'd have to be pretty messed up. I mean, no democracy is going to just say, no, let's not send money. I mean, the uh, uh, people do naturally, most people do naturally have some level of empathy. And when they start pe seeing people starve, that's when wallets open, right? So really, yeah, your finances are going to be totally fucked the longer this war goes on. The law, and, and by the way, this is a war that could be ended by making different strategic decisions in the West, right? <clears throat> okay. And, um, you know, today's actually been a quiet day. I regret that yesterday I didn't take a screenshot or something. This whole red to white border is usually lit up with little red icons. That's shelling, right? That's shelling. And um, there's a lot of civilians in there. There's a lot of civilians in there, right? So um, we sent HEMARS. 
or HIMARS, and they're firing from somewhere over here into here, which is good, which is something I talked about in my last video. That's good. There isn't enough of them, but yeah. Um, now, if we could take, if we could take control of the skies, right? So uh, Ukraine actually has a pretty good ratio of their soldiers to Russian soldiers in the South. The problem is air superiority because of all of the goodies Russia has here in Crimea, right? But if we could start getting them more advanced planes so they aren't flying suicide missions in these you know, Soviet era MiGs, um, they could start pushing back here, right? Pushing back here. And I also wanna be clear, there's a lot of farmland up here, right? So uh, the more territory Ukraine gets back and secured, the better. And another thing we need to focus on um, when we are talking about this food crisis, we wanna work with our partners in Turkey and Greece and Romania um in bulgaria and we want to make sure we open this channel right so that means a lot more anti-ship missiles and again more f-16s right so if we can open this this corridor for food that helps relieve some of those problems right but i mean the the overall big global economy problems those are going to be solved as soon as the war is over right and again even top military analysts now who at, at, at the start were saying yeah we need to consider nuclear war, we need to consider this. They've all started to realize slowly that uh, we aren't dealing with that kind of enemy, right? So we need, to take a, uh, we need to take a red pill, we need to take a reality pill, and we need to understand what we're dealing with here. Um, this isn't gonna end anytime soon uh, until, we, until we bring the big guns. I mean, that's it. All right, guys, Slava Ukraine, and um, I wish everyone a, a wonderful weekend.